Hello, Internet. Welcome to Parametric UMAP. As you see here on my left side, it is more or less exactly the same as UMAP. You just have one additional step, and you remember, when I told you about the topology, we now simply add a little bit of fuzzy topology. We switch on a neural network so we can calculate from a graph representation in a high dimensional space. We learn the weights of our neural network that then give us a mapping in a low dimensional space. And this was it. I say thank you and I see you in my next video. Ooh, okay. So now that all the people who clicked accidentally here on my video and just watch the five first seconds are gone. Now I know that there are two people out there in the universe who really care about this stuff. So for those two people there, somewhere on this planet, parametric UMAP. This is really, really interesting stuff. So I would say we have a look at the theory and then we go here and do the coding in parallel. So remember, the classical UMAP is a graph-based dimensionality reduction algorithm with a little bit of a Riemann geometry and some algebraic topology to find some low-dimensional embeddings of structured data. You remember in my last video I showed you there are two steps. You compute a graph representation of the data set, your original data set in the input space, you do this with a little bit of fuzzy, simplicial, complex logic. And then through stochastic gradient descent, you remember this from our neural network stuff, you optimize a low dimensional embedding of the graph. These are the two steps in UMAP. Now, the first step here in parametric UMAP, the advanced version of UMAP, is the same. Because we have to go from a data set where is it here? A data set in a 10 dimensional uh, vector space. We have to compute a graph representation in a high dimensional space. So the same logic applies. You remember, uh, we will do this. And yeah, let's just start to run the package. Uh, we will need to install some, some Python libraries for calculating the nearest neighbors. In our network, we have, of course, TensorFlow. We have to upgrade something and then we install UMAP Learn with the plot functionality. I do this here on a free Colab notebook, so no Colab Plus or Colab Super. We're just running here the normal free Colab staff. And then what we do is we install, yeah, we have, I have to use a TensorFlow probability additional uh, library. Then we just import our MNIST data set, our standard classical data set, where we have, I don't know how many, um, yeah, here we have them. We have pictures of our numbers from zero to nine. We have 28 times 28 pixels in our two dimensional uh, pictures. And we should have about 60,000 uh, pictures. Let's see what it takes the time. Oh yeah, Cloud Pickle is installed, the shader is installed. Here we go, TensorFlow probability. Install, no, uninstalling. Oh, we found already installed, yep. Oh, we upgraded to 017, beautiful. Amnis data set, and here we go. We have now 60,000 pictures as our standard data set. 28 pixels times 28 pixels. Beautiful. So first thing we built the graph. So this is exactly the step from go from here to here. Uh, it's shared with a non-parametric UMAP with the classical UMAP. So we use the same code for part one. And as we remember, just a little reminder, we built a nearest neighbor graph using pi and n descent, and we built a fuzzy simplicial complex. Now, this is the time when everybody tells me, yeah, of course, clear. Well, this is the reason why you study uh, mathematics at the university, because behind those simple code segments that we just run through here, 
And there's then here a code segment that says build fuzzy simplicial complex. There is a theory, and this is from the original UMAP paper you have here on the left side, fuzzy topological representation. And we have a simplicial set, we are uh, operating on functors. If you think that this is easy stuff mathematics, I can tell you, uh, I learned this at university in the sixth semester. So this is, if people tell me, hey, yeah, I'm a data scientist, but I do not know anything about mathematics, you're gonna have a really hard time because I almost do not understand what's going on here. You have a finite extended pseudometric space <laughs> and you have some beautiful categories. You have the functor definition from the different topological spaces. You have morphism defined. And now with the necessary theoretical background in place. So just, yeah, three years of university. No problem. You understand now. Yeah, we do a lemma, we do a combination, we do something else. We can now go to the optimization. Yes, beautiful. We define a cross entropy on two fuzzy sets here. Yeah? I had no idea that a cross entropy of fuzzy sets exist, but yes, this is the mathematics behind all of this. So good advice. If you want to understand this, e even part one, <laughs> we are still here at part one. Uh, fuzzy simplicial complex. Please go and try to read the original literature. You will be amazed. So, in our case, build a fuzzy simplicial complex. Some genius coded all of this. And we just have to execute it. And this is beautiful. But I want to have two simple thoughts you have to understand. What you do is you take the nearest neighbor graph compute the graph of the probabilities of an edge that exists between points. And you have a local dimension and you have a global dimension. The first one, you have local one directional probabilities. And we're here computing probabilities are computed between a point and its neighbors to determine the probability with which an edge or a simplex, of course, if you were talking about topology and topological spaces, exists based on the assumption that the data is uniformly distributed across a manifold in a warp data space. A local notion of distance is set by the distance to the k nearest neighbors, and the local probability is scaled by that local notion of distance. And here you have a beautiful formula. You have a local connectivity parameter, rho, uh, the xi is the nearest neighbors. You have a local connectivity set to match the local distance around this particular point upon its nearest neighbors. We have some hyperparameter and whatever else. But the nice thing is now, after computing the one directional edge probabilities for each data point, we then compute the global probability. And of course, as the probability of either of the two local one directional probabilities occurring. And this is such a simple mathematical formula. But if you want to code this, have and sake, I'm so glad somebody did this for us. Because look here, from UMAP, we just import fuzzy simplicial set. My goodness, six semester of mathematics at university level. And it is just one line of code that we can use. This is a lucky day. Oh, here we go. We import it. I hope it's working. <laughs> We get the indices, the distances, and then we just build our uh, fuzzy simplicial set. This is it. Beautiful. And what we end up is exactly our graph, our UMAP graph. Remember, this is here in a G10, in a high dimensional, 10 dimensional graph. Uh, this, we have now a graph from our uh, cloud data set. We did the graph. And now second step, and this is now different from the original UMAP, where we did this, stochastic gradient descent, optimize the low dimensional embedding of the graph. And now we say, hey, what about we do the mapping with a neural network? Why? You might ask. I hope you ask. Because we want to have, of course, fast inference for applying this model later on, on an industrial scale. So we want to have some benefits from our neural network. 
what we do is, okay, second step, you just say, okay, I have a, 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 in a topological space here, a graph constructed. And I want to have now in a low dimensional or a topological space, a graph, low dimensional, but with the same closeness information, with the same structure, with the same latent features, if you want. How to do this? Well, a train a neural network on this. As easy as you can think of. The mathematical theory behind this. Welcome, my two little people. I hope one of you is still listening. Uh, the mathematical theory behind this is non-trivial. So, we create a neural network model. We have in Port TensorFlow, what version we have? 282. We have, yeah, TensorFlow probability. I think we are going to use it. It uh, requires 2.9, 282 upgrade. Yeah, okay, let's try to go without it. And then what we do is here, and you say, hey, this is a simple. Uh, car we are here in TensorFlow 2, of course. It's We're using Keras functionality, and we have here a sequential mo Keras model. So we have here now a, the simplest convolutional network you can imagine. Um, and we define an encoder. And you might say, why is it a convolutional network? Well, we are working here on pictures, but if you want to have a standard classical definition, please take any neural network you like here, for example. Uh, from the literature, I found that you can go with a three-layer, 100-neuron, fully connected neural network. Also, so you do here TF Keras layer stands unit 100 activation ReLU. You choose your encoder, your neural network that you use as an encoder. And of course, we are going here with the convolutional network. So, and now the next step now becomes interesting because now we built the graph and the graph embedding. And what is our goal? Because we always have to focus what we want to achieve. After constructing the distribution of probability probabilistically weighted edges between the points in X. This is our input space, our data space. UMAP initializes an embedding in Z. This is the, the low dimensional embedded space corresponding to each data point where a probability distribution Q now in Z is computed because between the points as was done with the distribution P original in our input space, in our data space. And the objective now is then to optimize that embedding to minimize the differences between those two probabilistic distribution. So now finally you are at the first semester of mathematics, statistics, uh, probability distribution, Bernoulli distribution, cross entropy, functionality. Now you know we are at home. Cost function. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do a little bit of, of code first create the batch iterator. Now we want to create the data set to iterate over batches of edges and their nearest neighbor in our data set. So easy. We want to iterate over the edges and the neighbors. Just creating a TensorFlow data set that iterates over the batches of nearest neighbors based upon the probabilities determined by the graph reproduced. So higher probability edges are sampled more frequently. Remember word to back, same case. Now, if your curious was under the hood of some functions you see here that are straight on from the parametric UMAP library, do not ask. Otherwise, we are here for the next two hours, so do not ask. The number of epochs is 200, the batch size is now 1000 edges. And here, the, the beauty is happening. If you want, <laughs> we have now construct our edge data set and you have all the different parameters. Forget about it. Go read the theoretical papers, read the mathematical papers, and then we can come back and talk about the specific parametric embedding or reconstruction values. For the moment, just believe what is the default value. Then you have, yeah, you can print it, but this is not the point. Now, we compute the loss function. Compute the loss over a batch. 
And now we remember, we go back on the left side, the theory part, the distribution of embeddings in our embedded space Z is optimized to minimize the difference between Q and P. The probability distribution Q in our original vector space, in the input space, the data space, and P is now in our embedded space. Now the cost function, as I told you, because it's a Bernoulli, uh, is cross entropy and it's optimized by using gradient descent. And you say, hey, that's so easy. This is our original UMAP cost function. Beautiful. You can minimize it. You, uh, the task is <laughs> to minimize the cost function over every possible pair of points. This is a little bit computational expensive. So we do some trick. And we bypass much of that computation. Remember uh, the negative sampling with word to vec? The same trick applies here. I mean, the same algorithm applies here. You can more or less, if you want to understand it on a theoretical level, you can split the cost function into uh, attractive forces between locally connected embeddings and repulsive forces between non-locally connected embedding. The theory is clear. If points are far apart, they are non-locally connected, then you want that they separate from each other, but and therefore you have a repulsive force like dark energy, and you have attractive forces between locally connected embeddings, you want that they come closer together. So very easily from the idea, the implementation might be a little bit different. <laughs> so now back to the right side, we do now compute the loss over the batch. So there is a loss function defined for us and it's UMAP loss and all the magic is happening here. But if you want to get an idea, of course we are here, hmm, upper parameters, the spread of points. This is one of the, of the parameters you have to tell the system before it starts. How far apart how do you control how tightly UMAP is allowed to cluster your points? And this is just here, as you can see, the minimum, minimum distance is just a value dot one. So yeah, oops, I have to run this. Uh, needs to be computed twice. Parameters are used in the calculation. Yes, of course. So now we have this, we have to <laughs> grab, uh, take care about our embeddings. So first we pass the batch data through the network to get the corresponding embeddings. So we have our encoder and we do a predict function. Our encoder, where's our encoder? Where is our encoder? Gee, I lost sight of the encoder. There, here, here's my encoder. No, this, we use this one. We use the convolutional. Here's my encoder. My encoder is a TensorFlow Kara sequential model. Uh, yeah, maybe I should activate this model. I just noticed that the summary was empty. So here we have it. We have our layers here, convolutional, flatten, dense, dense, dense. You know the classical tensor reduction. If not, I have a video on the dimensionality of tensor algebra. And then we have our total number of parameters. And this is it. So good that I checked this. Now we are back here. Now that we have defined our encoder, we do now a predict on our neural network. And we have the sample edge 2x and the sample edge from x. There are two possibilities. Now the nice thing, as I told you, negative samples. Now the negative samples are quite easy to understand. The assumption is that randomly paired embeddings should have edge probability of zero. Because if it is somewhere in space, they are possibly far apart. Therefore, we just say, hey, let's do it easy. If you want it in a sentence, this is the sentence for you. UMAP learns an embedding by minimizing the cross entropy sampled now, and here we go, over positively weighted edges. This is the attraction force and using negative sampling randomly over the data set for the repulsion forces, allowing the minimization to occur over sampled batches of data. Beautiful. We say our negative sampling rate is five. This means more or less how many negative samples to train on per edge. So per single edge, we have five negative examples. 
And then we just say, okay, get negative sample and randomly shuffling the batch. And now to the compute the probabilities in embedding space. Now, please be careful because if you compute the probability in the data space and that is different if you compute the probabilities in the embedded space, because we have a complete different topological structure here. So here we are now in the low dimensional embedding space. This is the formula, and there is something going on to convert now the Euclidean distances in a topological space, and there is some norms and whatever. I don't want to go into this. If you want, you can read about it, but otherwise we just pass on over this. We just say, let's do this. And we said, yeah, we treat all edges as having a probability of one because there is an edge and all negative samples that are so far away that they have a repulsive force that they are far, far away as having a probability of zero that there is an edge. So easy to understand, not so easy to calculate, but we do it anyway. This is our negative sampling. So now what we do, we have now uh, a tensor, a tensorflow tensor concatenated. We have the, the tensorflow, the edges, and then we have here our zeros with the negative samples. So now we have our probabilities graph. We can compute now the cross entropy cost function that UMAP will optimize using, using, optimizing using gradient descent. Heaven's sake. This is beautiful. The nice thing here in this code, and this code is the original code from parametric UMAP, uh, you have, if you want to think about it in cross entropy, again, you have an attraction term. This is the first term here. And you have a repellent term. This is the second term here. You know all their different parameters. So you just say, okay, my cross entropy has the attraction term plus the repellent term, and this is exactly this term plus this term, and it gives you back, of course, your cross entropy, the cost function if you want, and it's returned with the attraction term, the repellent term, and the cross entropy. And then you just say, let's do the definition of this, and then you compute the cross entropy. You say compute cross entropy on your graph and on your distance. And now what you have now is your attraction loss, your repellent loss, and UCE loss. So all of this here is already done for you. As, as I showed you, you import just your UMAP loss function from your parametric UMAP. Done. This is it. Forget about the rest. So now that we have our cost function, we can now construct our model, our TensorFlow to Keras model. And we will optimize over the loss function. Here we go. This is a classical example of Keras. We know straight on from here. Uh, custom training loops. No, just, yes. Try another. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Additional loss function. So here, here we go now in parametric UMAP. We're on the theory side, on the left side. Regularization. Even in, in, in physics, you have regularization terms in your equation of motions, for example, or in your relativistic motional terms. In uh, machine learning, it is a modification of a learning algorithm to improve the generalization to new data. This is what we call, call in machine learning a regularization term. Now, with parametric UMAP, we consider now both regular, regularizing neural <laughs> networks with the UMAP loss, as we just defined, as well as using additional loss functions to regularize the embedding that UMAP learns. So we say now, okay, we have our loss function, I just showed you here, and we put there additional terms. So while the non-parametric, the classical UMAP optimizes only over the UMAP loss function, directly over the embeddings, just showed you. The parametric version applies the same cost function over an encoder network. 
encoder network. I just showed you our encoder, our encoder. Where's our encoder? Here, here's our encoder. Here is our encoder, our convolutional network. Now, by applying additional losses, we can use both regular regularize UMAP with as well as use UMAP to regularize additional training objectives. You might say, hey, this is, this, this is trivial, yeah? but for those who do not understand this at all, like me, first time I read it, I said, what? Let's have a look at the code because the code is beautiful. So where am I? Define and compile the Keras model. Now, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Try adding in a decoder. We up until now had an encoder. And now the idea is to decode it back. So to go from our embeddings and reconstruct, if you want, our data space. So adding a, to our encoder now a decoder and reconstruction loss here to make UMAP an auto encoder. And you might say, why? Why should I use suddenly an additional decoder, make the network slower? Well, you have a reconstruction loss you can optimize. You can add this term to our loss function. So you learn in both directions if you want, if you add a auto encoder functionality. And you know, and now we are switching back on the left side and I know that now I've left even my last listener. So I'm sitting here talking to myself. Auto encoders. Auto encoders, just to remind you, are by themselves a powerful dimensionality reduction algorithm. So does combining them with UMAP may yield additional benefits in capturing our latent structure we are looking for. So we use now an auto encoder as an additional regularization to our parametric UMAP. Now it gets a little bit complicated. You have UMAP and now you have an auto encoder hybrid. And this is simply a combination of the UMAP loss and the reconstruction loss as you see here, and the reconstruction loss for our, if you have an encoder and a decoder and the reconstruction loss, both applied over the network. Of course, it is our loss function and we just add additional terms to our loss function. So here we go. The ability to reconstruct data from the embedding. So remember, we are going now back from the low dimensional embedding space back to the high dimensional data space can both add in the understanding of the structure of nonlinear embeddings, as well as allow for manipulation and synthesis of data based on the learned feature of the data set. So we say, okay, okay, let's look at the code. Let's look at the code. What do we do? We are in Keras, so TensorFlow, we have a layer definition to X and from X and the inputs, of course, uh, here in this instance here, the Keras tensor. Yes, yes, yes. So we do the parametric embedding. We are here in parametric UMAP. So we have an encoder to X and an encoder from X. And then we just say concatenate our tensor embedding to and embedding from, and this is it. This is our, our parametric model. Now we have a Keras model. Inputs are inputs and outputs are outputs. Wow, intelligent. And as you know, with each and every neural network, you have an atom optimizer and you compile to your model with the optimizer and your defined loss function. Remember our loss function is the UMAP loss function. UMAP loss function here, this is the short way. We have the batch size, the negative sampling rate, the two hyperparameter A and B, the edge weight, and the parametric embedding turned on and Boolean value. Or if you want to have, yeah, here, yeah, this, there were explanations step by step. So where am I? Yes, I have to execute this cell. So here we go. We have our optimizer defined. And we compile the model. And now, now finally, you might say, 
we can train our model. This is all the reason why what we did to train our model. Heaven's sake. For more or fewer epochs, of course. So the steps per epoch, yes, are determining the training step. Yes, here we go. A parametric model. Bit. So we have our edge data set. We just go for, uh, I'm working on a CPU. Yeah, let's see how long it takes on a CPU epoch 2. Number of step, maximum Q size 100. Yeah, let's just give it a try. I just want to show you. Oh, not defined. Steps per epoch are not defined. Yeah, of course. I mean, I have to execute the cells. My goodness. So it's up and running. Yeah, beautiful. 14 hours. Hey, seven hours. So, okay. You can imagine maybe we should have switched on our GPU or our TPU on Colab, but this is just for demonstration purposes. I just want to show you that the model works, that this is the code. You can execute it. And yeah, you can plot it. You have to believe me this. And you will see that the encoder now does a little bit better. Yes, this is it. So we run through all the code. We let the network train itself. But let's go back here to theory. Theory tells us the issue with all dimensionality reduction algorithms is always there is a balance between preserving the local structure of the data in our data space, in our input space, and preserving at the same time the global structure of our data or of a graph. And algorithms that rely on nearest neighbor graphs, like UMAP, focus on capturing the local structure present between the points and the nearest neighbors. And now, and this is also another beautiful point here in parametric UMAP compared to just UMAP. In parametric UMAP, you can now impose a global structure by jointly training on a global structure preservation loss directly. So more or less you have an additional global structure where you have a global structure preservation loss added. So another, you, you play with your loss function and you add another term to your parametric UMAP. And in this specific case, if you're looking for if the global structure is of utmost importance for you, you maximize the person correlation within the batches between the pairwise distances in embedding and data spaces. This is not trivial, but there's some beautiful code I want to show you in my next video that we can do this in a nice and elegant way. And now I can tell you this was just the step-by-step -step explanation of how parametric UMAP works. And there is, of course, a version already encoded, everything I showed you, for you, that you do not have to understand that you can just run and execute. And surprise, surprise, this will be the content in my next video. And heaven's sake, I congratulate now no listener, because I'm sure I lost everybody in this presentation. But, you know, I think it's it's so interesting how mathematics, how insights from applied mathematics go into this simple task of dimensionality reduction and how extreme, extreme complicated and what mathematical implementation you run through just to do this. And again, if you're interested in this topic, I re really recommend the original uh, preprint uh, about UMAP, Lila McInnes and John Healy. Have a look at this. Look, it's already from 2018, but it's, it's really, really interesting to understand this. But of course, there are a lot of other dimensionality reductions and maybe I'm going to show you the very latest from 2020 or 2021, I suppose, that take a very interesting approach, but will use some part of the ideas 
that are implemented, that were implemented in UMAP in 2018 on the classical UMAP and later on in the parametric UMAP. That was the topic of our presentation today. Where, where is it? Where is it? Let's have it. Where is my parametric UMAP? This was it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a lot of things to read for the summertime. So I see you in the next video.